So um, the last time we spoke was about a year and a half ago, probably a bit more than that. Um, and at the time we were talking about my upcoming surgery, which is obviously now passed. But that was a consequence of an ileostomy surgery. And I believe that that was a consequence of overconsumption of potentially plant fiber, plant proteins, maybe seed oils. If I went to my doctor originally and he said, I think maybe fiber is your issue. Do you think I would have had a different outcome? Well, potentially, depending how early we got to it. Yeah. Unfortunately, in His Majesty's NHS, the people that work there are required to tow a certain line. They have to say a certain thing that they are required to say to you. And everything that they have been taught for all of about an hour or two, actually, within their five years of training to become a medical doctor, that's five years post um, their first qualification, by the way. So it's usually 10, 12 years to become a GP. And in that entire time, they get a couple of hours worth of training in nutrition. And the people that run that training in nutrition don't know what they're talking about. It's very, very unlikely that presenting to a GP in not just in the UK, in, in most westernised nations, you'll get the same nonsense, you'll get the same disinformation from, from these people. Uh, and it's not because individually at large they're evil people, it's because they've been taught the wrong thing and mandated to um, to push that line, I guess, or to, or to, to have that barrow out there. Um, it turns out, it seems, that the appropriate species specific diet for a human being is one that contains the muscle meat and associated fat mostly of large ruminant animals and ideally no plant material at all not a single bit ever ideally obviously as human beings we all have a bit here and there um some of us are more sensitive to that than others and lee you're in that category i guess Mm. Yeah, for sure. What's your opinion on plant proteins and, and gut health? Can they potentially contribute towards permeability in the gut, do you think? Well, absolutely. I mean, gluten is well known as an irritant for, I believe it's something like two thirds of the population have some level of gluten intolerance, ranging from, you know, mild symptoms right through to catastrophic failure. So, I mean, yeah, basically at the end of the day, the, the deal with plants is they cannot run away from you. They cannot hide under a rock. They can't dive into a pond, fly away, or avoid being eaten by you in the way an animal can do. They have to use toxins, anti-nutrients. It's chemical warfare, and plants have become very, very adept at it. Mostly a plant's defenses are geared around killing insects quickly and they do the ones that are good at that um, of course it's a, an arms race between the insects and the plants as well but most of these toxins will be will be very very effective against insects pretty quickly whereby against a human that's a bit more robust that can take several decades or longer for these problems to to accrue to a level that it's problematic but absolutely, they can be traced to such things. Of course, once you get there, it's hard to say, in, in your case, was it gluten? Was it fiber? Was it other oligosaccharides of some kind? Was it other proteins of some kind? It's really, really difficult to trace it. But I presume that you're like most people that suffer these kind of things in that when you then go, okay, let's remove all the plants, that the problem ceases to some degree. Uh, it's amazing how that happens, really. Um, but nonetheless, the NHS will still tell you the same things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had really bad skin before. I, you know, I was eating plants, bad skin, stopped eating plants, skin got better. I was depressed eating plants, stopped eating plants, depression went. Um, mm. Even though I'd lost my colon, believe it or not, my digestion improved vastly when I stopped eating plants. I didn't produce the same amount of gas. Um, hmm. Actually, I'm completely unaware when I'm emptying the food into the bag because I'm, I almost have to touch it to check, you know, how am I, is it all good? Because I don't hmm. even know when it's taking place. When when the plants actually were trying to struggle to, to empty in the bag, I'd often almost be forced to 
to aid the the output if you know what i mean so um yeah, yeah. for sure um with in terms of carbohydrates so we've got patient a and patient b and the mm. patient a is consuming well an abundance of carbohydrates just like patient b but patient a gets type 2 diabetes or when they check their blood sugar there's a bit of an issue there but patient mm-hmm. b checks their blood and they think that they're getting away with it because perhaps they're producing enough insulin to clear the sugar from the blood what's happening to patient b because i don't really believe that anyone gets away with anything that's right well i mean the first and foremost thing about carbohydrates is that they all break down to sugar and sugar is known above a normal physiological level to be toxic to human tissues it binds to the tissues chemically and alters their shapes it renders various proteins and, and various things that are supposed to work a certain way it, it makes them less able to work it's it's really not a good thing so that's the first thing you're going to get glycation of your tissues if you have a lot of sugar in your system Secondly, if you ask your pancreas to work over time for years and years and years on end, at some point it's going to wave a little white flag. And hey, presto, before you know it, you're a diabetic. I don't know what happened. I've eaten this perfect diet my whole life and now I've suddenly got diabetes. Well, it's because you asked your body to do something it's not naturally designed to do. We evolved as a species over millions of years into our current form eating meat and fat the whole time and the human the human species is kind of deemed scientifically to have begun it's thought maybe 300 maybe 350,000 years ago was when the first humans are thought to have walked the earth and they ate meat and fat meat and fat more meat and fat occasionally they ate sort of rooty tubery fibrous type things when there wasn't meat to be had that was it nothing that humans eat currently but basically just about everything plant-based that a human being eats these days is a human invention not one of these plants existed in the form that we eat them in naturally these these are all things that we have created so it, it leads us to all these kind of problems. Uh, I'm never going to say that diabetes is a blessing, but it's almost a blessing for patient A to get it sooner so that they know they have to react and stop doing that sooner. Interesting. At the end of the day, I think. What we're really talking about here is a need for people to entirely, completely forget everything they think they know about human nutrition. Everything they've ever been taught, wrong yeah sorry about that yeah meat and fat isn't no meat and fat's easy to swallow it's great for sure for sure um for people who don't understand what glycation is what is that that's when a glucose molecule or a fructose molecule or some other sugar chemically binds itself to usually a protein structure of some kind part of your body part of your cellular matrix or you know one of those kind of things And this chemical bond means that this sugar that's kind of tagged onto this protein is now interfering with that protein's function. Because proteins all work precisely because they have an exact shape. And if you add things to that shape, you change the shape of it and you make it less effective. The more things that are stuck on any given protein, the more sugar molecules that are stuck to it, the less it looks like the original protein, the less effectively it works, basically. Okay. Mm. What kind of health outcomes can someone expect if they were to modify their carnivore diet to look mm. something like a meat-centric diet or an animal-based diet with now mm-hmm. fruit and honey? Um, because mm-hmm. my understanding is that fruit and honey are both high in fructose and deuterium. So, and mm-hmm. I think that maybe both of them are a bad idea. Well, for a start, you can expect to sound like Beavis and Butthead and say dude a lot in your videos. Um, You can expect to start looking like a chewed chewed slipper. 
very, very quickly, suddenly, there are going to be issues with glycation. If, uh, I mean, we all know who we're talking about. That individual that we are talking about is very, very active physically. Surfs three hours every morning, weight trains a couple of hours after that every day as well, and spends the rest of his day grifting on people that don't know any better by making videos telling them to eat sugar and honey. At some point, that individual will run into some very, very serious health problems, if he hasn't already, because it seems like... Mm, imagery taken of him even three years ago before he started this ridiculous nonsense and compare that to how he looks now wow 10 years 15 years of aging in the space of two or three it's incredible he's wrong basically we evolved consuming 80 percent or so of our so-called calories heat units in the form of the meats and fats of mostly large ruminant animals, not plants. And to suggest that we need to consume an amount of sugar to be healthy is ridiculous. The exact physiological nutrient requirement for human beings for sugar is not one single gram ever. Now, I had a bit of an exchange in writing on, on my thing with you know how keyboard warriors like say oh but uh, type 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 one said to me during the week this week oh yes but what about children when they're born infants they drink mother's milk which is full of sugar so you can't really say that sugar's you know, not one single gram ever to which i had to correct that individual to say well actually the sugar is there for purpose in the milk it's there to optimize weight gain which is one of the other things you can expect on sugar if you're not as active as the individual we're talking about hmm. he will gain some weight when he stops being quite so active but until then it's just the glycation and the stupidness okay um yeah it's it's a it's not a good picture and at the end of the day i sort of said to this person that was talking about you know mother's milk breast milk etc that it's optimal for a pre-weaned infant to consume some sugar to assist in the weight gain in the early part of that person's life but that doesn't mean they need it if you remove all the sugar from mother's milk and just fed the mother's milk with no sugar they'd still survive right. so i'm still correct not one single gram ever is required by human beings somebody else come at me though try something else <laughs> it's all good fun well i mean if you think about it i get a lot of this actually in the comments but when, when we say for example we have the nitrogen 15 stable isotopes that indicate that humans throughout history have eaten a minimum of around 80 percent fatty animal products consisting mostly yep. of ruminant meat well what about the other 20 percent if we were indeed mm. consuming these tube like fibrous tubers maybe a bit starch maybe minimal amount of starch berries nuts and things like that mm. if your argument is sort of ancestral consistency then why shouldn't we be doing that why are we not advocating for that do you think that the produce that's available to us today and um, with mm. the, what know in terms of what the science does tell us that that's a good idea just seasonally local and ripe to to even consume some berries some nuts and things like that well look here's the way i i would view that if we're going to use the ancestral consistency as a reason to eat any plant material at all fine okay the reason that our ancestors ate any plant material at all i would surmise would be in subsistence between successful hunts hmm. okay here's what it was they dug up these we're calling them tubers but they're not like tubers of today not like potatoes not like sweet potatoes nothing like that we're talking about stringy basically roots bulbous roots if you like that were consisting of basically fiber and what ancient humans did is they had to boil these fibrous things for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to get them to break down enough that we could even eat them and then we'd eat these things and then we had a small capacity to ferment some of that material a very small amount of it and the result that we got from fermenting the the fibers was a short chain fatty acid butyriate which is a hundred percent saturated it's a fat it's not a sugar 
yeah. these these roots contain basically no glucose to speak of no starch to speak of we've selectively bred uh, modern tubers to have much more starch and be sweeter and much more palatable and need a lot less cooking and all of that so if you want to be ancestrally consistent absolutely any time that you can't afford meat or you can't get meat or catch meat or whatever absolutely go and eat some roots of selected plants that aren't too toxic for us be better go and ask your ancient ancestors which ones are okay avoid everything that's a human invention that's been selectively bred over generations to be more palatable and eatable and basically full of sugar or starch which breaks down to sugar avoid all of those things and, and then you're being ancestrally consistent go for it but basically you walk into a into a supermarket or a green grocer or you know marketplace or any of those kind of places where plant-based so-called foods are for sale you won't find a single thing there that isn't a human invention a lot looks like it's been hybridized from the looks of things modified or mm. they've increased mm. the size they've deleted genes and the bitterness and things like that um yeah at the end of the day our ancestors ate very very few nuts seeds berries i mean berries for once were were available several weeks excuse me several weeks a year mm. if you're lucky you, we didn't have them all year round we didn't have airplanes and boats bringing them around from yeah. the other side of the world or anything like that when they were available we took advantage of it sure which was really and also people say oh yes but the hadza the hadza eat honey well several things there number one the hadza are a modern people how do I know? Because they exist now. We can go and see them if you like, if you can find them. Or you can do what the individual we were talking about earlier did and go and sit with them for half an hour for a photo op and then just make videos about how you're an expert in their, in their culture. <laughs> oh, oh, my word. Hilarious. Anyway, they're modern people. Okay. And they say, oh, well, we, we've been eating honey forever, they say, apparently perhaps as long as you know in living memory but do they do that every day oh that, you know we went and we went and got some honey from a hive and ate it that day says that individual who actually didn't do that they sat in a photo op but here you go he was told the story about the last time they went to a hive and got some honey they don't do that every day right yeah that's it's a rare treat sort of thing um absolutely human beings are opportunistic and we do have the metabolic capacity to cope with some sugar some carbohydrates some starch in our diets without dropping dead immediately mm. but nonetheless it is a subsistence thing for human beings to do to consume carbohydrates we are not designed to do that and, and when i say designed i always mean by natural selection pressures Right. over billions and billions and billions of years which by the way does not preclude go right back to the beginning and saying well where did the first life come from was it a god but the, maybe but since that time we know absolutely that the original design here is the ingredients plonked there either by the anthropic principle or by god if you like mm -hmm. and it's changed which was the design of the anthropic principle or god if you like it doesn't matter but we are where we are we have changed we have adapted positive and negative selection pressures on our genes are a thing darwinian evolution is not a theory it's a fact okay people get it together um so that's where we're at with it and yeah it, it's there is just no place in the human diet for piles and piles of sugar none at all yeah which also means piles and piles of carbs because they all you know, break down to the same. Right. I've had 